Hi everyone, welcome back to another video in the Web Security Academy series. In today's video, we'll be using a union-based SQL injection attack in order to retrieve multiple values in a single column. All right, let's get started. This lab contains a SQL injection vulnerability in the product category filter. So we've got SQL injection and it's in the product category filter. The results from the query are returned in the application's response, so you can use a union attack to retrieve data from other tables. We already learned how to exploit union-based SQL injection in previous labs. The database contains a different table called users with columns called username and password. To solve the lab, perform a SQL injection union attack that retrieves all the usernames and passwords and use the information to log in as the administrator user. So the end goal over here is to retrieve all usernames and passwords and log in as the administrator user. This slab provides us with a hint over here. We're not going to look at it just yet. We'll revisit this section over here when we're working with the lab. Okay, let's access the lab. Okay, let's create an analysis section. All right, so it looks like the same shopping application that we've been dealing with in the past couple of exercises. If we click on, for example, lifestyle, it'll filter based on the products that are related to lifestyle. And we'll see over here that it filters based on a category parameter that is in the URL. So that's the parameter that is vulnerable to a SQL injection vulnerability. Okay, so the first thing to do to confirm that it is vulnerable to a SQL injection vulnerability is to inject it with a SQL character that could potentially result in a syntax error, which could result in an internal server error at the application level. Okay, so now I'm convinced that this is vulnerable to SQL injection. Now, since the results are displayed on the page in at least one column. We could use union-based SQL injection in order to output content from other databases. And to do that, we said the first step would be to find the number of columns that the vulnerable query is using. And to do that, we'll use the order by clause and we'll iteratively order by each column until we get an internal server error. If we get an internal server error, that means we're ordering by a column that does not exist. And so it gives us an indication on the number of columns that are being used by the vulnerable query. So we'll start off with one. And we don't get an internal server error, which means that this column exists. And notice over here that it didn't actually order this column, and so this is not column one. Column one is a column that is not displayed on the page. And so since it's not displayed on the page, it won't help us in terms of displaying usernames or passwords. So let's make a note saying not displayed on the page. Next, let's try with column number two. Okay, so column number two definitely exists, and it's this one over here, because you'll see it order the alphabets. So we'll make a note over here, displayed on the page, because that's a column that we can use in order to output data from other tables in the database. Okay, let's try with three. And we get an internal server error. So what that means is we're trying to order by a column that does not exist. And that's why the application threw an error, which means that the number of columns is 3 minus 1, which is equal to 2. 
and we know that the column that is displayed on the page is two and so that's the one that we'll be using in order to output data on the page. So the second thing that we said we have to do in a union-based SQL injection attack is to find which columns contain the data type text. And the reason behind that is because when we're outputting usernames and passwords, we're outputting content that is of type text or of type string. And so we need to output them in columns that accept types text or string. So to do that, we said we use the union operator and the select statement. We know that we've got two columns based on this. And so instead of having null null in both columns, we start testing each column out to see if it accepts the type string. So in this case, A. Now, testing the first column is not really useful because it's not outputted on the page and so we can't actually use it. But let's try it out either way. So we get an internal server error, which means that the column does not accept data type text. Let's try with the second one. Okay, and we could see A over here, which means that the second column accepts data type text, which should have been obvious from the beginning because you could see over here that it has alphabets in the column. All right, so this is our column over here. I'm going to put two stars. So the third step is to output data from other tables. And in this exercise, we're interested in a user's table, and we want to retrieve the usernames and passwords of the users of the application. Now, we run into an issue over here, and the issue is the fact that we only have one column in order to output data in, but we want to output data from two columns, both the usernames and the passwords column. So what we could do is output each column at once, so union select null for the first column and then username from users table and what that will do is it will output the username entries from the user table in column number two Here we go, we could see administrator and Carlos and another user right over here. And then in order to output the password, we run the query again, except we output the password over here. And you could see over here, it's outputting the passwords of the users of the application. Now, I don't want to do this in two separate queries. I want to be able to output both the username and the password in the page all at once in one query. And the way to do that is by using certain payloads. And we'll look at the hint section over here that was provided in the exercise. So you've got over here a string concatenation depending on the database that you're working with. And what that is, is being able to concatenate several strings into a single string. So in Oracle, that's the way you do it. In Microsoft, that's the way you do it. In MySQL, that's the way you do it, and so on. So we'll use that in our exercise. However, we don't know the database that we're working with. So we first have to figure out the database before we know how to concatenate strings together. And to do that, if you go down, you could use the database version command. And then based on that, you can tell what database you're working with. So let's start off with Microsoft. So it would be over here.
and it's no longer from the users table. Okay, and we get an internal server error. That means we're probably not using the correct syntax, which means that we're probably not dealing with a Microsoft database. So let's try with PostgreSQL. So the syntax for that is version. Here we go. Okay, so it outputs the version of the database and just because the payload or the command that is used in order to display the version of PostgreSQL databases, now I know that I'm dealing with a PostgreSQL database and I know the exact version as well, which is good information to know. So I'm going to copy that and put it over here. Now, the reason we wanted to know the exact database is to figure out how to concatenate strings. So if we go up, that's how you do string concatenation in PostgreSQL. So our new command would be select null and then username. And then what is the two bars or the OR operator password from the users table. And this should output both the username and password into a single column. So let's try that out. And here we go. So it shows that it's outputting the username and password, but I don't know where the username ends and where the password begins. And so what I'm going to do is add one more string. So a character that I know is an added character. So let's say a star. And this way it will place a star between the username and the password. And let's try that. And here we go. So you've got all the users of the application and now you can tell which is the username and which is the password. So let's save that over here. Okay, so the end goal was not just to display all the usernames and passwords, but to actually log in as the administrator user. So let's do that. So username is administrator and the password is the one that we just found over here. So everything after the star character, click on login. And it says, congratulations, you solved the lab. So we successfully completed the exercise. If you would like to see a detailed version of the video where we both exploit the vulnerability manually and then script it in Python, check out the video linked on the screen. Also make sure to hit the subscribe and share button so that the video reaches a wider audience. Thank you and see you in the next video.